conflict resolution without violence. Is it possible? I assure you the world doesn't think it's possible because the world has never seen conflict resolution without violence. Now, I'll state up front that, of course, it is possible. In fact, it's inevitable. And I'll give as evidence for that. In the Baha'i communities of the world, there are about six and a half million people. These people have conflicts. Every human being has conflict. As long as there are two people on earth, there will be conflict. But in the Baha'i community, violence is not an alternative to the resolution of conflict. And so it is, from the community, totally absent, <coughs> except in those cases where it is either accidental or is a gross violation of our spiritual principles. Uh, so we have already in the world a community that's dedicated to conflict resolution without violence. In humanity at large, we've been, what, 50,000 years or so, believing that the only way to ultimately resolve conflict is by violence. Uh, for most of that time, might has made right, and the strongest <coughs> have prevailed. However, in the more enlightened ages, most recently, we can see that this is against our own self-interest to be violent in the settlement of our conflicts. And so people are beginning now to look for solutions to conflict that do not involve violence. As a matter of fact, until the middle of the 12th century, violence was quite common as a legal means to settle in conflict. As a matter of fact, under the English common law, uh, you had the right to prove your case by combat. And if you were accused of a crime, you could have yourself acquitted of that crime if you successfully defeated the sheriff uh, in combat. Of course, the community's always selected the most handy sheriffs <laughs> for this work. That, as a matter of fact, uh, an interesting hap thing happened in the middle of, of, of last century, the 20th century, now we know being in the 21st. Uh, one of the United States Commonwealths had adopted the common law of England as its common law. And so this fellow had been arrested for some crime, and the judge asked him when he came before the judge how he pleaded. And the man said, uh, okay, Your Honor, I plead not guilty. And the judge said, okay, do you want a trial by a jury, or do you want a trial by the, the judge sitting without a jury? The man said, neither. He said, I want a trial by combat. <laughs> well, the sheriff went pale. <laughs> this evening in the courtroom, and they looked in the book. Sure enough, there was no rule that said you couldn't have a trial by combat. Well, the, the, the DA and the public defender quickly made a deal and uh, got the sheriff off the hook. But nevertheless, as, as recently as, as those times, this idea of violence in the settlement of, of, of conflict was a part of our culture. Now, we know in the writings of Baha'u'llah that the well-being of humankind, this is a quote, the well-being of humankind, its peace and security are unattainable unless and until its unity is first fully established. The world doesn't believe this. The world believes that if you get peace and security, then you get unity. That if you solve the uh, the peace equation, then everything will come nicely and we'll have unity and we'll all live happily ever after. And so it is a surprise to the world to hear God's messenger for this day, the whole law, say that unity is the essential element in the preservation of peace and security of the peoples of the world. We get unity first. And unity precludes the application of violence and solutions because unity is the antithesis of violence. Unity is the group expression of love. Uh, it is a coming together, not a driving apart. So as we look into the 
century to come, we see the writings of Baha'u'llah inviting us to unity and to a means of dispute resolution that does not involve either physical, mental, or other violence. Well, let's see what alternatives we may have existing as we go into the next century. And here is what people will tell you are the alternatives. And I think they're pretty exclusive. If you can think of any more, let me know. First of all, they'll, they'll uh, give you the opinion that science may be our deliverer in this next century. Because we can pretty well predict that disease will all but be eradicated within the next hundred years. That is epidemic disease. Uh, we know that uh, genetic manipulation will leave us a lot longer lives, will be healthier uh, because of scientific and medical discovery. We're right now, this very moment, working at nanoscience. You know, we're working with atoms. But things are only one atom thick. And when you can start working with atoms and make them do what you want to do, pretty soon you'll have a molecule, which is a computer. Uh, and uh, all the things that we now uh, see done in great big scale will be done by things that are invisible, including the changing of the very way we live our lives. And so people are very ecstatic about science. They'll say, science will end disease, science will end hunger, science will, will end poverty, and science, therefore, will bring us into this era of great peace. Ah, uh, would it? Or will we just have longer living, better fed? It does whatever the will of man makes it do. Or it can be horribly destructive, depending upon what we say it ought to be doing. And therefore, it is the will of human beings that will change the application of science for or against the abolition of violence in, in future society. Therefore, it requires human beings to adopt a new state of mind, a new idea about science. And science gives us no clue at all about how to adopt that idea. Well, another solution perhaps is politics, political power. Because we've seen, of course, that uh, politics is the way most people govern their lives. It is partisan political activity. They decide that the majority rules, and uh, they settle their disputes by simply yielding to the view of the majority. Some people say yielding to the tyranny of the majority. But nevertheless, this seems to calm the water somewhat, because at least you know what the rule is. The rule is what most people say the rule ought to be. Or in our judicial political system, the rule is what the Supreme Court says the rule is. So, the politics has a major flaw. The flaw being that politics is the art of compromise. Even in its best aspects, uh, political compromise is the way things are run. That means you give up something that you really want. If I will give up something that I really want, and then we'll both have something that neither of us wants. Uh, and therefore, the world will be a happy and peaceful place. Well, obviously, this is, this is not going to work. Uh, this kind of dissatisfaction with the system and with giving up something which is dear to you is always manifest until finally it erupts in some kind of um, conflict. Even the economics of the political sphere, if we use economics as a scale to measure whether we can eradicate conflict in society, proves the same thing. That economics in a materialistic world tend to make the ones who acquire want to acquire more. And the people who don't acquire want to take what the people who have acquired have acquired. Uh, this is 
it's not productive of peace and tranquility in society either. Nor is it productive of peace and tranquility in society for there to be an artificial political leveling of the planet, as in communism, where everything goes to a common pot and then everybody takes uh, something out. Because this paralyzes the work of the world. Because our abilities, our energies, our capacities are all different. And each of us has the ability to contribute what someone else doesn't have. The, the ability to contribute and uh, therefore is entitled to gain recompense for, com for contribution and to work so that the world can be rewarded by our work. And work without reward and service is hollow. You know, if you're just out there pounding rocks and not realizing that you're benefiting anybody by doing that, uh, soon that, that pales and conflicts arise. Well, if it isn't science and it isn't for politics or economics, then it would have to be some kind of a spiritual solution, right? Something that works on the mind and the emotion of human beings. And so you say, well then, it has to be religion. <coughs> but my goodness, look at what religion does in the world now, and how could you ever hold that up to be an answer to dispute resolution without violence? Perhaps the most violent communities in the world have been religious communities engaged with other religious communities. Some of the worst and most horrific fights have been spawned over attachment to sectarian religion. And so if there is to be a religious solution, then it's going to have to be one that nobody has expected. It's going to have to be one where everyone moves to higher ground and doesn't together uh, to higher ground. And it doesn't stay on the plateau of separation that presently exists uh, among religions. Baha'u'llah, in the middle of the last century, pronounced to us the solution to this spiritual revolution dilemma by reconciling religion at its basis and announcing its progressivity at the other end. So that religions now could look at themselves as part of a unified base of strength from which a higher tower of ability to solve the world's problem ought to be built because we are fundamentally the same. We are certainly the same spiritually. The differences having been created by material rules for day and ages which have made the religions work different. In the same quote that I gave you before, where Baha'u'llah says that unity must precede peace and security, he says what it will take to have this come about, this unity. Because this unity, he said, will depend upon adherence to what his pen has revealed. In fact, he said the unity is unattainable. Uh, as long as the message revealed by the Most Great Pen is ignored. Now this is a pretty powerful statement to make. In other words, what he's saying is God has spoken again to this day and age about the issue of unity and the resolution of conflict. And unless we listen to God as he has spoken this time, the unity is not attainable, upon which depends our peace and security. Now, when it, what Baha'u'llah is really saying there is, if people don't listen to this pronouncement of God, the game is over. Because nothing that we uh, can achieve as a human species can be done, except through acknowledgement of God and his will for human beings in this particular day and age. Surprisingly, more and more 
people are being driven to this conclusion without the Baha'is telling them that. Uh, there have never, never, never in this country been more people searching for spiritual solutions than there are this very night. There have never, never, never in this country been more people attracted to the Baha'i faith than there have this night. So we think of something very big happening with respect to what's happening within the Baha'i faith. Meanwhile, without the Baha'i faith, people are seeing the futility of violence as a way to end the uh, 25 years ago, courses in law schools in alternatives to the legal system, the courts, uh, as a means of settling disputes, were rare indeed. Today, they're some of the most popular subjects in law school. How to solve disputes among people without resort to litigation. And this is a recognition, I think, of the necessity for developing a system which can be used without violence. Uh, courts and their resolutions are not without violence because courts deal in win-win situations. Every day of my judicial career, I would have to say to several people, you win, you lose, it's over. Now under those circumstances, the best you can do is to make 50% of the people unhappy. I, if you're a little more skillful, you could probably make more than 50% of the people happy. But usually that's, that's the way it happens. Now they're not only happy, unhappy with the system, but they're unhappy with each other. Because the same dispute that brought them in there in the first place has left another dispute, a winner and a loser, to face each other in society. And so the modern systems of non-judicial settlement of disputes, take away the win-lose scenario and seek to have people consult about their difficulties. That is, talk with each other to the end that they can achieve a settlement which is both of theirs and therefore both win. Uh, I learned the lesson, I may have told you this before, but I, I learned the lesson early on in my judicial career about what people want when they can come to have their disputes settled. When you're a very young judge, they usually put you in small claims court. For small claims is what you see on television. You know, judge Judy and Joe Walker people court decisions, which uh, deal with disputes with the, between people that don't have lawyers in court with them. Well, in this case, I first or second day in court, I was really feeling like I knew everything. First or second day in court, this lady came in who had sued a dry cleaner for damage that he had supposedly done to some clothing she left with him. And of course, the plaintiff in the action, the lady who brought the action, goes first. And she, so she testified about all the damage that had been done to this clothing. And when she'd finished, I asked her if she had any more. She said no. But she hadn't even proved that she knew this was the cleaner she'd taken her clothes to. So obviously she's not going to win. So I pulled myself to my full height, raised my gal, I pounded it on the bench, and I said, judgment for the defendant, for the cleaner. Didn't need to hear from him, right? She wouldn't have win. She had the burden. He didn't have any burden, so he was the winner. Well, with that, you thought I'd shine or something. He jumped up, he pounded on the table in front of him with all his might. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, sir, wait a minute. You won. Go home. <laughs> he said, you didn't hear what I had to say. I wanted to tell you what this woman has put me through since she brought this silly suit. And he went on and on and on. And it came to me suddenly. <clears throat> he really didn't care whether he won. He wanted somebody to listen to him. And most of the people who have conflicts, first of all, want 
want somebody to listen to them, you know, to hear their side of the story. Even if, even if whoever's hearing it doesn't like it or has the power to say no, even if they're wrong, they want somebody to listen. So listening is the very, very beginning of resolution of conflict without violence. We first need to develop the individual capacity to listen. Now, we do this all the time because most of the conflict, by far the vast majority of the conflicts in society are settled without ever anybody talking to anybody except the person with whom they have the conflict. This is the way we resolve our conflicts usually. Just by, you know, sometimes we say, sorry, I didn't mean it, or I did mean it, but, but they, you know, these things. And so we are, we're solved in a much more gentle way. And when they're more complex, perhaps they need others, a community of interest to listen and to make suggestions on how they should resolve their conflict. The Baha'is do this in their local spiritual assemblies. Baha'is do this in their families, even, or in groups that are not uh, local assemblies, so that we have a basis for starting out our dispute, our conflict resolution, by listening. First step in Baha'i consultation is to discover facts, right? Now, how in the world can you discover facts without listening? You know, you have to absorb what happened, gain an understanding and then an agreement about what are the facts. And then undertake the application of the principle that you deem uh, appropriate for this situation. So now, in this next century, we have emerging the spiritual impetus for the change, the state change in state of mind that we need to undertake conflict resolution without violence or even thinking of it. And we also have a divinely ordained mechanism where we, where we can practice the art of conflict resolution without violence. Now, this is about the best thing we can give to society the spiritual motivation and the mechanical means for attaining this level of dispute resolution. Shucks, if it works for 6,500,000 people, it ought to work for the globe. And so this is the announcement we make to the world that the process is already here. Just pick up the books and read about it mingle with the Baha'is in practice because it's not only inevitable, it's already here. I didn't say I'd be long. <laughs> <laughs> but we can entertain discussion and questions. Debbie had a hand. No, I have a question. How does this process work when you're working with someone No, at first you have to want to, uh, or at least be attracted to it. Uh, lots of times, just now we're, we're leaving for, uh, spiritual motivation aside for the time being, in terms of, of a normal mediation in society. Uh, sometimes people can be attracted to the, to the subject without really wanting to, <coughs> until they get a glimpse of how it's going to work. Because nobody trusts anymore people to listen to them until they've actually experienced somebody listening to them. And so in the process of mediation, if it's done well, early on, the people who are at least attracted enough to come into the, to the process will see that, by George, somebody is really listening. And uh, if that somebody happens to be the adversary, how wonderful. And when it becomes, as it must inevitably be, the adversary who does listen and participates, then the, va the validity of the process makes itself obvious. Uh, not everybody will consent even to, to start. Those people, I think, need to have a change of spiritual attitude. You know, they need to be socialized to 
a higher degree of sensitivity. <coughs> and that the faith can do for them too. Yes, sir. Would, the pe would not the people that would be more willing to go this approach, for want of a better word, be the smarter, or I guess I should say education would be a big key to to accept it rather than people who just had no... Yeah, I, I think I would have had no difficulty at all a few years ago saying that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. But where this system works the best at the present time is among groups with the least degree of sophistication and education. Now, this probably should not be surprising because it is the natural way for people to end conflict. <coughs> Violence is really not a natural way. Uh, women will tell you, and after <coughs> all, more than half of us are women in the world. Women will tell you that violence is not a natural way to, to end <coughs> conflict. Uh, and so this, is, this has turned out to be a man kind of thing throughout the ages. And now, as women have come into more, higher and higher recognition for their equality, the scales are changing uh, in favor of milder ways of ending conflicts. So as women enter the, the arena, uh, their appearance is even more important than degree of education because even highly educated men still you can see them in parliaments all over the world. Even highly educated men tend to be hostile because they think that's what the world expects of them. You know that they should be strong and virile and macho and uh, ready to fight. And proud to see their sons be exactly. warriors. Exactly. You know, but the, the mothers would rather not see their son even exactly. go into such a consider a mother and a father. Which one is likely to refer to their son as a wimp for not fighting? The father. Mother never, right? The mother's going to say, God bless you, son. You know? You're smart. And the father's likely to say, what in the world's wrong with you? Why didn't you knock his block off? Because this is the way we're socialized. Well, here again, this socialization is changing. It's changing not only because of, of the uh, <coughs> ascent of women in the world, but it's changing because of Baha'i attitudes. Uh, because in the Baha'i faith, you'd expect both father and mother to say, my, that was a good thing you did, you know, refusing to, uh, to have a physical fight. Did you have a comment, Gladys? Yeah, this um, same thing that's been applied, been applied to like we see in the writings or in the Bible about people following in the footsteps of their own fathers, mm -hmm. of the men. It's, you know, it's in the Bible too. And this is why some people don't want to even look at the Baha'i faith or read anything or listen to what it has to say. But they want to go on in the same way that they had gone on before, which is like you saying, the macho way. Mm -hmm. Whether it's no, and, and of course there are roles for men and women in society. There's no doubt about that. Uh, one cannot do all that the other can do. This is it, it's a complementary society. But the complement is not one should be violent, one non-violent. That's not the way it works out. You see, our our real capacities have to do in which way we can serve, not in which way we can defeat. And uh, men are much more uh, win-lose oriented than I think are women. One more thing in relationship to a matriarchal society. Is this what? I'm sorry. Matriarchal. There have been, and there still are some. Mm -hmm. Even I think among maybe even among some of the Indians, there were matriarchal societies. So some of the uh, tribal. Matriarchal societies. And uh, give us some information about that. In you know, it, 
That's a very interesting subject. You should, uh, um, Rian Eisler, about 20 years ago, wrote a book called The Chalice and the Blade, which was the result of, uh, of uh, anthropological studies of <coughs> groups of uh, people, mostly ancient, which were either matriarchal or patriarchal societies. Now, what her study showed is that it's not matriarchal or patriarchal that matters. It's dominator societies. Where one sex has dominated, they have been violent. Where the sexes <coughs> have been balanced in the community, they have been peaceful. So in, in the uh, woman-dominated societies, and there have been in the North, several, uh, role reversal is almost complete. And the women have undertaken the role of warrior, of uh, violent solution, and the men, the more pacific uh, balance of society. Uh, her point being that it is the sharing of the uh, ideals, aspirations, and work of a society that makes the society peaceful. That domination is not the way to go by either sex. But cooperation is the way to go. And so she became attracted to the Baha'i teachings because of that and talked at several of our conferences, as a matter of fact, about uh, the principle of the equality of men and women, which she held in itself to be a good thing. Now, I think she adopted sort of a materialistic approach about it, that you didn't need anything spiritual about this. All you needed was men and women to be equal and society would be uh, well, perfect. Uh, at any rate, I'm confident that Baha'u'llah's principle in equality uh, is absolutely true. The, that uh, our functions are different, but our capacities for service are the same, just maybe not the same as spheres. Kaylon? I have a question. I'm wondering how much of the spirit of violence is affected by our misunderstanding of what justice is. And, and I know that Baha'u'llah talks about justice, and I'm wondering if you could explain, are we making a mistake in understanding of justice? Society doesn't understand what justice is. And as a matter of fact, you ask 12 different people on the street what justice is, you get 12 different answers. Uh, some of them quite hostile to the idea of uh, equality or equity uh, in, in the law. Uh, and that's because justice is seen by most people as what you get or what you seek. In the Baha'i writings, justice is what you do. In the little hidden word about justice, I, I keep stressing that to me, the most important word in that whole hidden word is probably the littlest. Because he says among there, ponder this in thine heart, how it behooveth thee to be. You know, he's not talking about looking out there for what somebody else is doing to you. He's saying that justice is my gift to you to be. So all we need to worry about is being just, not receiving justice. Because justice in the Baha'i faith is an individual kind of thing. Social justice is the application of Baha'i administrative uh, policy and, and principle. But the, the, the real justice is how human beings treat human beings. And therefore, it behooves people to be just in their dealings. In the gleanings, be unjust to no man. And show all meekness to all men. This is, this is like the, uh, the filling out of the golden rule that Baha'u'llah says we should treat our neighbor 
better than ourselves, that we should prefer our neighbor's interest to ourselves. This is Baha'i justice, you see. Uh, and it doesn't have to do with putting people behind bars or uh, settling disputes <coughs> even. Because in a truly just society, the need for resolution of dispute is enormously diminished because disputes won't arise in a society in which you genuinely prefer your neighbor's interest over your own. Uh, we will, in the future, be so good to each other that our disputes will be on who can give the most. We'll, we'll be generous with each other and look like two Persians trying to go through a door. It'll take a long time. No, you first. No, you first. No. You see, it's attitude. It probably is just an extension of what's going to happen in the world. That we really genuinely feel that the other person ought to go first. Now, what a great world it is. When you got five billion five hundred and ninety-nine million five hundred and ninety-nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine people who think more about you than you do about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that you see, this is the paradise that that we've been been waiting for. Now, it may not arrive to that. You know, a couple of those people may not do that. Is it possible to understand and appreciate this meaning of justice? without believing in life after? No. Uh, you see, we can say you have to know your purpose in life in order to understand being just. If you think this life is where we live, I don't think there's any possibility of you understanding what it is to be just. Because you protect it. I mean, you want to perfect this life when the virtues that we seek are to perfect our life elsewhere. Yeah, I say, I say this all the time. Where you live is where you're going to be the longest. Right? Uh, that's your permanent home. Somebody asks you where you live, you give them your permanent residence. Well, this ain't our permanent residence. You know, we're only here for a while. Our permanent residence is in the other worlds of God. That's where we live. This is where we prepare. The womb is where we prepare for this world. This is where we prepare, prepare for our eternal world. So when you're preparing for an eternal world, and that's the way you define things, you define justice according to those terms. <laughs> rather than according to a world where you get three score and ten or, and, uh, and then you're out. Arthur. I think the end point to me of uh, doing justice to a conflict is, is something like a body assembly setting where you, where, where the assembly at least does not take in a side where all the parties are involved in gathering fact mm -hmm. because if you go to a court system nowadays everybody tries to suppress the other people's facts and make sure that they don't know this or they don't know that or make sure they don't present this as much as they can as much as they can get away legally in a body setting which is like an ideal there is no adversary the assembly or whoever the advocate <coughs> of the people is we try to gather all the facts from both sides and see what is the best scenario so there is no adversary but I think we have a few scenes in the middle, you know, from the court system of now where the people go at each other, they have the arbitration and they have mediation. Mm -hmm. is, is mediation, there is no adversary or the, 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 the mediation, both parties must agree to. And they will agree in the beginning that at the end, they will have an agreement between them as to what they will be doing. Uh, and they're not going to stop until they get that agreement. People would tell them what is right, what is wrong. No, no. In fact, they, they will have a mediator. 
Now a mediator, and in a Baha'i terms, I suppose we'd call it facilitator. It's one who doesn't really take part in the deliberations, but makes sure that there's an exchange on a rational and non-emotional level of the facts, so that the parties themselves come to the conclusion. And as I say, this is the way most disputes are settled without a mediator. I mean, neighbors have a, have a backyard squabble, they settle it without any trouble, they just get together and they do it. Well, if you can't do it that way, then you need somebody to help you do that. And if you can't do it with somebody helping you, then you have to put it into a system that you trust to be fair. So, so arbitration is, is again much closer to the court. Yes. Except it's much shorter and much simpler. No, there aren't any rules of evidence, so you can listen to things you can't listen to. Yeah, okay. Science cannot answer moral questions. And I think one of the major problems that is going to be facing humanity is if he can control the knowledge that we are gaining is the same thing as Baha'u'llah said to Abdu'l-Baha that there is something on earth hopefully the humanity has, has the capacity to understand and then the socially have been ripe enough to understand I'm paraphrasing to understand <coughs> basically we're talking about atom power so I think the same applies today because all these things that, that we are going to have it can have tremendous side effects for the society for the whole world yes and, and, and if there is no, is not balanced with, with religious and moral principles, God knows where it's going to take us. We may still be suffering from whatever is already happening to our earth. The ozone yes. is diminishing, you know, the, the ocean gets polluted, you know, in, on a daily basis, we're creating so much waste, we don't know what to do with it, even now. Yeah. And we may be already on the downhill course. Could be. You know. Now, but, but you see, science still has the possibility to save us exactly. from ourselves. That's true. But we have to will. We have to have the will to go that route, rather than the will to spend ourselves out of existence. Uh, and only a spiritual change is going to cause that. Uh, you're never going to frighten the world into saving itself until it's too late, uh, because there there are always going to be those selfish ones who say, "Well, look, I'm only going to be here for half a century or so anyway. What do I care? The Earth is not here." in a hundred years. Uh, so, it takes a spiritual frame of mind for human beings to control science so that it works to their benefit. And what a marvelous thing it is when it doesn't. How great it is that, that Baha'u'llah says that, that science and religion are in harmony, you know, that they're part of the same uh, revelation. They're here for both of them for us to use. And how pitiful if we don't use them in harmony, if we keep them compartmentalized. And so here we're polluting ourselves out of existence, and over here we're praying to be preserved. You see, it doesn't make sense. Once we get the prayer and the action together, then we have it made. And this is, this is I think, permeates the Baha'i writings, that we need to have a solution to our moral dilemmas uh, and then apply the good science that's available to help us. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, we have conflict resolution sort of as a society and then conflict resolution individual to individual. Mm -hmm. And I have a question just in terms of the individual to individual. There are people in the world who become bullies, where kids find that they can pick on kids who are weaker than them and go on and on and on, because they find it makes, I get builds themselves up, whatever reason, and these other kids who are being picked upon really have no recourse. A bully might even have a parent who feels that, well, oh, my son is strong, he's a leader, he can, he can make others bend to his will. In this kind of situation, what is a proper conflict resolution without violence where the child being picked upon, you, you go to the authorities there, and then what happens after school or whatever, there's, there's no one to defend them. Well, the proper response, and not too often available, ought to be community. One of the reasons that a village is good to raise a child is that this doesn't happen in a village. Uh, because a village understands the rights and prerogatives of everybody in it, 
uh, and will not let children grow up so that they're able to be bullied or bullied. So until families learn this, and of course this is a basis of family education too, I would think, until families learn this, it's a community responsibility, I think. So to take it one step further, if the community tries to create something and you bring in the parents and all the teachers and the counselors and the administrators and the school psychologists are all there and the parents are angry, don't even want to be there. You know, so I mean, obvi I mean obviously the problem, it's a systemic problem, right? It's not just yeah. the child. Uh, it really starts when human beings develop a sense of shame. Uh, one of the things that I think is missing from our materialistic society is there is no sense of shame. You know, there's no such thing as, as wrong anymore. There are just degrees of right. Uh, and unless someone has this sense of remorse for having done something against society or against God's will, there's very little hope. So what I hope we can do is to induce in society this kind of feeling that some things are shameful and we ought not to do them. Probably we start by getting to the children without the parents, I don't know. Some of the, the generations may be lost you know, who have been so far into this that they're so conditioned they can't get out of it. You know, when they say, why am I, why am I here in school? Well, I, I didn't do anything wrong, you know. It's my kid. If you want to you discipline him, you discipline him. Right? Not, none of my business what you do. Uh, that's hard. But when children are raised in a community of interest, which does have a sense of shame, and I present to you, and with all of its warts, the Baha'i community. When children are raised within a Baha'i community, both children and parents get the idea of what the boundaries of propriety are and how it is much, much better, you feel better by being nice than you do about being mean. And you learn early on the old adage that it's better to give than to receive. And it's far better to be given than to take. So um, the Baha'is have a head start, I think, on that. With, with all of the woes that we may have brought in from our outside world into the Baha'i community, we certainly have a better opportunity to deal with this. And we certainly would open up the subject to anybody who wants to talk with us about that. Because if they look at our Baha'i communities and they see that we are somewhat more successful than the generality of humankind at raising children who are not violent and who are not bullies, they may ask us. And, uh, and we can tell them, no, we're not perfect, but we sure try. Now, I think it was Jim and came on. Are we to the point where we can offer <coughs> this model society, say, uh, for gang violence or racial violence or hate crime violence? We already have. First of all, the House of Justice said, we offer you, in the peace state, we offer you as an example the Baha'i community. Now, that's a pretty good source of offering. And I hope we're ready. But uh, I know in, in all sorts of communities, in Pasadena, uh, we're working with the City Human Relations Commission right now to establish in place of violent resolution of conflict, models of solution of conflict, including models of race unity and models of gender equality. And we hope to get them published in the newspaper. This is working in the community. You know, everybody can see what isn't working. I mean, it's not very hard. And it, the, the newspapers are 
full of stuff that doesn't work. And so we're trying now to show them examples of things that do work, because I think people resonate better to things that do work. I think people are tired of this. They don't want to have to live in a society that, this way. I mean, you don't want to have your, your, if you're the police chief, you don't want your granddaughter shot. You know, and we don't want our children jeopardized or anybody. Uh, simply because they don't have a model of what it is uh, to be happy. So yes, we're, we can present. How, how do we go about presenting it, say, to the LA County Human Relations Commission or something like that? Well, we're trying right now. And the Baha'i communities have audience with them. Uh, we've done it in Atlanta, in uh, Detroit, in Pasadena. Maybe we'll get it in Los Angeles. Actually, social proximity, I think, is partly an answer to uh, sectarian and uh, divisive hate. Once you know people, in fact, I think Baha'u'llah quite clearly states in, in Abdul Baha Firm that a broad base of intermarriage among the peoples of the world will go a long way toward eliminating these causes of friction. Uh, and certainly, people that you know well and with whom you have meals and, and interesting conversations are not on your hate list. It doesn't matter how they look. If you have this degree of friendship with them, they're not on your hate list. No matter whether they look like people that are different from you. So, here again, the Baha'i community, if you can, if it's in good shape itself, show the world an example of a community of people that look like they couldn't agree and ought to be enemies that aren't. I remember our very first Baha'i fireside when uh, we first came into contact with the faith. One of the things that just frightened me about the fireside was the fact that there might be a terrible fight in the room because it was such a diverse audience. I had never seen uh, an audience such as this undertake anything in friendship. I don't remember what was said at that fireside. Couldn't tell you what the subject was. I don't even remember who the speaker was. But I do remember the feeling that was in the room. And the room was filled with unity and diversity. It was filled by people who had this common goal. They may not have all been behind. In fact, I'm sure they weren't. Uh, but their community of interest trumped their diversity. So that it made their diversity helpful rather than harmful. Okay, Is it possible to take God out of this whole process of developing virtues and succeeding to give birth to it in a, as a society? It's possible, I think, in the short run, don't you? I mean, I think it's possible to teach virtue for virtue's sake. Uh, because if you start with children, you can teach them that if they are kind to other people, people are likely to be kind to them. Uh, and therefore, enlightened self-interest means that you should be kind. But, this can only run so far. Uh, until they start experimenting and see that there is no punishment for the trespass on a virtue. In fact, in some cases, you can even get ahead by not being virtuous. So going back to what you said before, unless you have the sense that this is not our life, that we're really preparing for something greater, and this includes God, then the teaching of virtues will come to a dead end sooner or later. Persian language, there is a word for people who lack virtues. They call them zerang, means they are smart. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I would think you know, in the American business sense, you would call them sharp. <laughs> because they are able to take advantage, you know, mm. where advantage can be taken. Mm. Well, and you know, that's that's an option 
that's open to people. They can take advantage all they want if they think that's to their ultimate uh, good. But unless they learn it early on that this is not to their ultimate good, this is not why they're here, this does not earn them points or arms or legs in the spiritual world, uh, then virtues, virtues education becomes the means of spiritual growth. Really, we fool ourselves if we think that we can secularize virtues and get away with it and build a society on that? Oh, sure. Uh, if we think that that's the permanent solution without reference to uh, immortality or God. I mean, it's nice to teach virtues, and I certainly wouldn't discourage anybody from doing it. And schools are doing it all the time, you know, they're secularizing. Uh, virtues because it makes for a more peaceful society, it makes a more pleasant society, let's put it that way. But when there's when there's no punishment, when you step outside the virtue, and no real reward for remaining virtuous, then why do it? When a kid is taught that thrift is a virtue, and then sees somebody make a killing at gambling, and decides, you know, the heck with thrift, I'm going to become a stockbroker or something. Then, what was the use of teaching them thrift in the first place? I think, you know, this goes back to the, to the fact that we have to have a faith, because these things are very subjective. Whatever is virtue to somebody is a bad character, another person is us. And I don't think we really need to go too far. We have had communist countries. If you really look at Marx and his writing and Lenin and so on, they are teaching virtues. Oh, sure. They are teaching virtues based on sciences. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work. It just simply didn't work. There are going to be conflict created because we build a common sort. It's just like in a Baha'i community. Every time we sit in an assembly, the something comes up, we don't know, we go to the guideline. Yeah. You need the word of God, you need Baha'u'llah and his writing to, every time you get lost, you say, look, we are all Baha'i and this is the law, let's see what that says. And I think that's something like that needs to be there, that everybody abides by it, otherwise, you know, it could, you know, it could become meaningless. It's pretty hard to tell a child, why should I? You know, when he sees the whole world is doing the opposite thing, getting along just fine. Well, I would like to thank you so much, Jim. This was very stimulating. This is very important. And I am hoping that it would start many other doors of exploration, becoming involved in the community.